Anyway, in this particular video we're going to be looking at paper 3 and it's the specimen paper set 1 for NXL and if you follow the link through from the description box you'll be able to download the paper and have a go at some of the questions for yourself. Okay, so we're going to move on. I'm going to aim for this video to be about 20 to 30 minutes in length and, um, and then I'm going to stop it. Please do have a go at all of the questions and uh, compare your solutions. Okay, so let's move on then to question one which involves a scatter graph. Now with this I've already drawn in the line of best fit which is this line here and what that does is it clearly identifies something called the outlier and that's the first part of the question. It says write down the coordinates of the outlier. Well, it's the one that's not compatible or comparable or hasn't got a close con correlation with the line of best fit. It's very clearly something that's uh, a bit of an anomaly. OK, so the coordinates for that are coordinates for 10. OK, so if we then look at uh, part B of the same question, what we're doing is drawing a line of best fit, which I've already done. And also it says describe the correlation. Well, as I mentioned before, it is a positive correlation. Um, however, this is a two mark question, so it's better to just have a little bit more information in there. And what I've said is that if you increase the hours revising, you might get better marks. OK, and then finally, um, I've got part C of this. It says estimate the mark gain for a student who studies for nine hours. Well, if we go back to the actual um, spreadsheet, the actual scatter graph itself, then you'll see that I've put a line up from nine hours, taken it across, and that will say 64 marks. However, I will note that in the mark scheme, um, it actually allows you a variation between 60 and 70 marks. There's plenty of scope there. OK, so the Spanish test was marked out of 100 and Lucia says, I can see from the graph that had I revised for 18 hours, I would have got full marks. OK, well, I'm sure revising for 18 hours is going to help, but not according to the data, or at least we haven't got enough data past 13 hours. So we've got to be very careful with this. And for these sorts of questions, you want to make sure that you've got only the data. It is true that if you went on for 18 hours, the chances are you would get a very, very high mark, but you can't say that from the information. So what they're asking you to actually do is just simply to write a line that says there is not enough information or data past 13 hours. OK. Right, so let's move on then to the next question. That's question number two. And question number two talks about um, the length L of a line measured in centimetres is 13 centimetres correct to the nearest centimetre. It says complete the following statement. All right, well, if we have a look at that statement, what we're saying is, is that this is actually bounds because we've got this point here, which means that it's less than. OK, so if we have a look at correct to the nearest 13, the lower bound is going to be 12.5 centimetres and the upper bound is 13.5. And that fits perfectly well with the statement at the bottom where we can say that it has to be less than 13.5 but it can be the same as or greater than 12.5. OK, I hope that's all right for you. Let's move on then to question number three. And question number three, we're being asked to deal with a straight line graph. And in this particular case, we're asked to uh, find the equation of the straight line graph. Well, it very helpfully gives you at the bottom here the standard form of a straight line graph as being y equals mx plus c. And what they mean by that is two things. You need to be able to work out the value of m, which is actually the gradient. OK. And also the value of C, which is the y-intercept. OK, now that's fairly straightforward because the y-intercept is basically where it crosses the y-axis, which is this point here, and we're going to call that plus 1. OK, so that's fairly straightforward. Gradients is a little bit trickier, but um, it's, uh, it's probably easier just to remember it as difference in y divided by difference in x. OK. 
Um, so what we mean by that is we can draw a triangle. So if we draw something like uh, there, what that allows to do is to work out the difference in y, which is the difference between 9 and 1, okay, which is going to be 8. And then the difference in x is the difference between 4 and 0, which is going to be 4. Okay, So we could write that as 8 over 4, which equals so we've now got the two components that we need and we can write our line as being y equals 2x plus 1 and that's the answer to this particular question. Just incidentally I sometimes see this as y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 that's perfectly fine. Sometimes I see it written as rise over run. Um, which is, um, I don't come across it very often, but again, that's perfectly fine as well, if that's the way that you remember it. Okay, so let's move on then to question number four. Now, question number four is going to ask us, using some data, some information on the table, to work out the mean waist size of some belts. Well, when we're talking about mean, we're talking about totals, we're talking about an overall average, okay? So let's just have a look at the small belts here. Um, there's 24 small belts have been sold to the 50 customers. Um, the average size in the small belts is going to be 30 inches. So what that means is, is that if we want to work out the total number of inches sold in small belts, what we can do is we can multiply frequency and midpoint. OK, and what that will do is it will give us the ability to work out the total number of inches that have been sold in small belts. And that's going to be 720. We can basically do the same for all the other um, averages as well, or all the other belt sizes. So that's by 34. And that's going to be equal to 408. OK, the next one is going to be um, 8. And it's an average of 38. And that's going to give you 304. OK, and then the final one is 6. And that's an average of 42. And if I work that out, that's going to be 252. So if we put all the belts end to end that have been sold in the shop in, in the month of May, then it would be a total of 1,684 inches of belt. OK, so that's one6 uh, no, it's not. That's 1,684 inches. That's a long, long way. OK, and out of that, that's been sold to 50 customers. OK, and it does actually tell you in the text there's 50 customers. So if I want to find out the average belt size, all I do is I divide the total amount of inches of belt sold by the total amount of customers. And that's going to give me 33.68. So it's going to give me 33.68 inches of uh, as an average waist size. OK, let's have a look at part B of this particular question. And it says, belts are made in small, medium, large and extra large. And Jenny needs to order some more belts in June. So she's going to order three quarters of the belts in size small. So that's the total number of belts. OK, this is the total order. OK, and the manager shop tells uh, Jenny she, she should not sell anymore. She should not order so many small belts. Who is correct, Jenny or the manager? OK, well, if we look at that, what it means is, is that if she's going to order 50 belts in total again, she's going to order three quarters um, of 50 as size small, which is going to be um, 37.5, or if you like, 38 small belts. OK, well, actually, um, if you look back at the chart, only 24 small belts were sold. So basically... Jenny shouldn't order 38 belts out of 50. So if I put in here, Jenny shouldn't order 38 small belts out of 50. OK, because actually if she did that, then that would be a percentage of 76%. OK. Um, what she should do is she should order, so if I put in here, should order 
uh, 24 out of 50 in small belts and that's going to be equal to 48% rather than uh, three quarters or 75% of her order. Okay, I hope that's all right for you. So it's just really a bit of an interpretation of the English itself. Okay, let's move on then to question number five. In question number five, we're dealing with a trapezium. Now in a trapezium, there is a formula that you need to remember. Okay, now in this particular case, uh, we're talking about a wall um, and we're going to cover it in tiles and all that sort of good stuff. So let's just not worry about that too much. Um, let's just worry about, because it's a trapezium, what we're going to do is work out the area of the trapezium. However, you'll notice, which is very, very typical with these sorts of questions, is that they tell you one measurement in centimetres and then other measurements in metres. So what I'm going to do is right off the bat, I'm going to actually change this to centimeters um, straight away because if I do that then it means I'm working in the same units every single time okay and it just makes my calculations a little bit easier a bit it's going to add a few noughts to my answer but it just makes my life easier so let's just look at the area of the wall so this is the area that this particular uh, lady is going to have to cover with tiles so uh, trapezium formula is area equals a half a plus b times h. Now, I do see a lot of trapeziums in uh, GCSE exam papers, so it is well worthwhile remembering this formula. You could, of course, cut it up into kind of a, a rectangle and then a triangle and work it out as a composite shape if you wanted to. Uh, you're going to get exactly the same result, but if you remember the formula, it just might be useful to you. Okay, so let's have a look at that. Um, so let's push in some numbers. I've got a half, and A is 108 which is at the top, plus B which is 270 and H is 80. So when I calculate all of that out it means I've got a wall at 18,000 centimetres squared. Okay, so from that then we need to work out how many tiles. Well let's look at the area of an individual tile. Well it tells us it's 15 centimetres by seven and a half centimetres, okay? So the area of a tile, okay, is gonna be simply 15 multiplied by 7.5, which is going to be 112.5 centimetres squared. Okay, so I've got my two bits of information. So really, if I know the area of the tile is this, and I know that I've got that much to cover, if I divide one by the other, what I'm going to end up with is a, a number of tiles that I'm actually going to be using. Okay, I'm sorry, my, my light's gone a bit odd there. Okay, so let's have a look at that then. So um, if I want to find out the number of tiles, all I'm going to do is take the total area, which is 18,000, and I'm going to divide by 112.5. And what that will give me then is 160 tiles. Okay, brilliant. Now it does tell me then that tiles are sold in packs of nine. Okay, nine tiles in each pack. So if I want to then figure out the number of packs, okay, then all I need to do is divide 160 by 9 and that's going to tell me that actually I need to buy 17.7 .7 packs. Well I can't buy 0.7 a pack so in order to answer the particular question I would need to buy 18 packs. Okay, so use Karen's method to work out an estimate for the number of packs of tiles she needs to buy. Well, that's what I've done. I've taken the area of this wall by the area of the tile to work out an estimate. Okay, and you can clearly see um, each of my stages of my working. And I would suggest with these sorts of questions to maximise your marks. Bearing in mind it's actually a five mark question, it's well worthwhile making sure you show each of the steps that work for you. Okay. So let's have a look then at part B of this, and this is uh, an additional two marks on this particular question. And what it says is Karen is advised to buy 10% more tiles than she estimated. Okay, well she estimated that she would have to buy 
um, 100 and I think it was 60 tiles. Okay, so what we're going to do, if she's going to buy 10% more tiles, so 10% more tiles, that's going to be 160. And I'm going to add 10% to that, but actually it's easy for me to convert it to a decimal. So I'm going to multiply it by 1.1 and that's going to give me 176 tiles. Okay, so she assumes that she will need to buy 10% more packs. Well, if she needs to buy 176 tiles, then the number of packs for 176 tiles will be 176 divided by 9. So actually that's going to be 19.5 packs or if you like 20 packs. OK, so that's the first bit. OK, so um, she that's the actual amount of packs that she needs to buy just working it through. However, if we know that she said that she needed to buy 18 packs what they're getting at is the actual number of packs that she um, thought she would buy is going to be the estimated of 18 plus 10 percent okay so again it's 18 packs multiplied by 1.1 and that's going to be 19.8 okay so yes in fact her assumption is correct that she'll see she needs to buy 10% more packs of tiles um, because she would need 20 packs, whether she works it out or she just buys an extra 10%. OK, hope that's all right for you. Let's move on then to question number six. And question number six deals with a factorization. Now, I've got to say, in every exam, you're going to have factorizing. So please do make sure that you're OK with these sorts of uh, questions. OK, so with this particular one, we need really two numbers that when we multiply them together, will make minus four. And when we add them together, it will make plus three. Well, that's going to be four and minus one. OK, so I'm going to write that out as x plus 4 multiplied by x minus 1. OK, if I just wanted to check that, I could just check that as x times x is x squared minus x plus 4x minus 4. And if I bring those two terms together, I'm going to get plus 3x. So in this particular question, I can answer this as x plus 4 multiplied by x minus 1. OK, now we're up to about 17 minutes in this particular video. I'm going to stop there and then we'll move on to question 7 in the next video. I hope that's been useful to you. Please do add a comment below if you're not sure about anything. Um, have a look at some of the other videos within the playlist, subscribe to the channel and I look forward to seeing you inside the next video.